Um, hello, all, and welcome to the second installment of Learning the Lessons of Afghanistan. I'm Will Hopkins. I'm the director of New Hampshire Peace Action. This program is co-sponsored by Massachusetts Peace Action, Maryland Peace Action, Chicago Area Peace Action, Peace Action Maine, and New Hampshire Peace Action. I'd like to give thanks right off the bat to Massachusetts Peace Action for handling the tech and doing the lion's share of the organizing to make tonight's event possible. In the spirit of understanding and respect, we'd like to acknowledge that we're doing our work here, uh, here in New Hampshire on the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. And wherever you're joining us from tonight, please take a moment to think about and honor with gratitude the land and waterways that have been stewarded through the generations before the arrival and genocide conducted by European settlers. As we, uh, as we move into this program tonight, I would like to talk about seven policy proposals that, uh, that Cole um, Harrison of Mass Peace Action wrote to help us keep our eyes forward uh, in building the peaceful and moral future we envisage as it pertains to Afghanistan. Number one, the US must stop making war on Afghanistan. No more drone strikes, bombings, special forces, or aid to rebel groups. Number two, engage with the Taliban and establish normal relations with the new government. We need to pay reparations to the Afghan people for the harm we've caused. And we need to accept Afghan refugees who are trying to, uh, who cooperated with us and are trying to escape the country now. Number three, support regional diplomacy by convening Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, and others to guarantee the neutrality and, su and support the stability and development of Afghanistan. Number four, clean house in Washington. Conduct a thorough investigation of the lies, fraud, and mismanagement. Remove everyone who, was, who incompetently managed this war and the national security officials who managed it for the, the past 20 years. Number five, end other US interventions in the Middle East by withdrawing troops from Syria and Iraq, ending arms sales and military assistance to Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel, and sanctions on Syria and Iran, and rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. Number six, repeal the 2001 and 2002 authorizations for the use of military force. Pass, pass the National Security Powers Act, S2391, to ensure that any future military interventions, arms sales, and sanctions are approved by Congress and have limited terms. Number seven, deeply cut the Pentagon budget and use the funds made available to resettle refugees, launch a global COVID-19 vaccination drive, reduce inequality in our country, and address the climate catastrophe. Tonight, after each of our speakers have had a chance to talk a little bit about their own perspectives on the end of the, of the United States' longest war, we're going to have a chance for some Q&A. Uh, there are a lot of us on tonight, so we do ask that you use the chat feature to put forward your questions when the time comes. And I will do my best to make sure we get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, tonight, I know I'm, I'm extremely excited about our lineup of speakers, and I'm going to introduce each one, and then I'll turn it over to them to give a talk. Um, rather than introduce all three, I'll introduce them before they get started. I'd like to start tonight with Phyllis Bennis. So Phyllis is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Study. Uh, and in the Peace Action affiliates around the country, a lot of us frequently fill a lot of roles between program, lobbying, fundraising, media, policy. Uh, and we're also expected to really grasp US foreign policy and its complexities and have paths for the future ready to offer our members. Uh, this is why most of us know who Phyllis is. If you wanna keep abreast of US foreign policy and understand international relations, in my opinion, Phyllis Bennis is the most important mind in contemporary US foreign policy. Her primers and articles are thorough, uh, they're well, well written, and I know in my work, I've come to depend on them to keep me able to thoroughly understand international relations and keep a reasonable and positive path, path forward in my sites that I can communicate with my members. In 2001, she helped found and remains active with the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. She works with many anti-war organizations, not just peace action, writing and speaking widely across the U.S. and around the world as part of the global peace movement. She's served as an informal advisor to several top UN officials on Middle East issues, 
and was twice, twice shortlisted to become the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territory. Phyllis has written and edited 11 books, among her latest, Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror, a primer, as well as the just published, published seventh updated edition of her popular Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict. She's also written, and this one's very relevant to Afghan policy, Before and After, U.S. Policy in the War on Terror and Challenging U.S. Empire, How People, Governments, and the U.N. Defy U.S. Power. Phyllis, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn it over to you to respond to uh, Cole's seven points and tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about Afghanistan. Well, thank you, Will. It's great to be with Peace Action, all, all the various peace actions. Thank you all for your years of work as one of the really important legacy organizations of the anti-war peace movement in this country. I, I want to acknowledge something about that for a moment starting. You know, we've we fought for 20 years to end the U.S. war in Afghanistan, knowing that getting the U.S. troops out would not end the war for Afghans, but that it would end one big, big component of that war. And we now have that happening. But we also know that this is not cause for celebration. It's not like Vietnam, where I know many peace action people were active during Vietnam as well. And that was liberation at the end of the war. This is not really liberation for the people of Afghanistan. They have a long struggle ahead. Uh, and it's not cause for celebration there or here. So it's harder in some ways than it was around Vietnam when a lot of things were, were clearer. But there are lessons, there's the future to look forward to, and we're gonna have to fight for that future. Uh, you know, we, we heard from President Biden the other day that they, you know, they've learned the, the lessons from Afghanistan, that one lesson is we need a clear exit strategy, we need clear strategic goals. And I'm thinking, didn't we hear this once before after, after Vietnam, we heard the same thing? They don't learn these lessons. They don't learn these lessons. This was a war that was fought not for particularly oil or military bases, although both of those played a role, but it was a war fought for vengeance and to prepare the American people to go to war in Iraq. Bush is still a war criminal after these years. But it is hugely important that the US is pulling out its troops and for the moment at least, also pulling out its contractors and, and others who were always worried about maintaining these wars. A couple of things that Biden said the other night I think are true and important. Uh, one is that it was the right decision to pull out. It was too late. It was a decision that should never have come up because they never should have invaded and occupied Afghanistan 20 years ago, but since they did at any moment, it would have been the right time to pull out. That was very important. It was also crucially important that he acknowledged twice in the speech what the cost has been for people in the US because people don't know that. They don't know that it was $2 trillion over those 20 years. Nobody really knows what a trillion is. It's one of those ridiculous numbers. You might as well say it's a bazillion dollars, but he broke it down. And he said $300 million a day to pay for that war every day for 20 years. That's what we have spent on that war. Imagine, of course, what that could have purchased in terms of at home, jobs and healthcare and a Green New Deal and Medicare for all and abroad for diplomacy and for development, for clean water and education all around the world. But no, we spent it on war. So the question of telling lies is an old story and it hasn't changed yet. We heard lies in President Biden's speech as well as those important true statements. Uh, he said, we believe that the, the Afghan military would defend their country. Well, first of all, they were never charged with defending their country. They were created to defend a government that was set up and imposed on Afghanistan by the United States in the image of the United States staffed by leaders and people who were chosen by the United States to represent the interests of the United States. So this notion that somehow 300,000 troops, which was another lie, would inevitably defend that government, that was clearly not the case. So one thing we have to learn from this is to demand that they stop telling lies. The abandonment of Afghanistan did not start three days ago when the US finished pulling out its troops. The US abandoned Afghanistan with military occupation. It abandoned Afghanistan by imposing a US accountable government, ignoring the political culture of the country that had never had a history of 
centralizing power in a capital hundreds and hundreds of miles from, from much of the country. It abandoned the women of Afghanistan when it spent $2 trillion over 20 years and left the women of Afghanistan still number one in infant mortality in the world. Despite some small incremental gains, it is the worst place in the world today for a woman to give birth and have her child survive to her first, her first birthday. That was the abandonment of the women of Afghanistan, not pulling out the troops two days ago. So I think that we have to come back to the basics here, that there is no military solution to terrorism, that the US drone strike, if we needed any more evidence of that, the US drone strike that was allegedly in reaction to the ISIS-K bombing at the airport, we don't know that it, that it hit any of the alleged two uh, ISIS-K members who may or may not have been hit at all. What we do know is that a family of 10 was killed, including six children, four of them under the age of four. That's what we know. That's what we know. We know there is still no military solution to terrorism. We know that this was about vengeance and not justice. And it left those tens of thousands of Afghans dead, millions, of Afghans losing their homes, many forced into exile as refugees. It normalized the use of torture for the United States. This is what it has, it has brought. So it's not surprising that somebody like Mabuba uh, Siraj from the Afghan Women's Network said just two days ago, she felt an absolute sense of relief when the US troops finally were gone. So we have to figure out how to respond to this. Our main crisis right now that we need to be dealing with is the humanitarian crisis, not only for the refugees, although of course, we all of the examples in, in Cole's very important list of lessons is crucial. We should be demanding unlimited numbers of refugees, lifting all those caps, stop charging $575 per person, every baby, every woman, every man, every child, every teenager, just to apply for humanitarian parole into this country. That means that for most people, it's an impossibility. We need to ensure that, that economic aid continues to flow, and that means talking to the Taliban. So this call for no relations has very serious consequences for the people of Afghanistan, because we can be sure that the Taliban themselves will not be the ones who will be hurt by that. It will be their families. It will be the children. It will be the old people. It will be the women. It will be the men. It will be the people who will face the consequences of sanctions if new sanctions are being imposed. And if there is no relations with the Taliban to ensure that there's a way to negotiate getting those aid shipments in, opening up the roads, getting the airport to open up, all of that is going to require dealing with the Taliban. What is the Taliban going to be like in the future? We don't know. We don't know. Have they changed? We don't know. And we're not going to know for a while. I'm afraid that most people in Afghanistan are not going to know for a while. What we do know is that the circumstances in which they are taking power have changed dramatically. Many of you may have seen that, that, that set of photographs of the Taliban fighters with their guns surrounding the presidential desk in the presidential palace in Kabul the day they marched into the city and took over. What was stunning about that photograph was how many of them had their cell phones out taking selfies. That wasn't true 25 years ago. Nobody had cell phones in Afghanistan. No one had access to the internet. Nobody had the, those ways of linking to the rest of the world that they do now. This is not any longer a population that has been long isolated from the rest of the world. We do know that. We know that this is now a country of 35 million people, far more than there were at the time that they governed 25 years ago where more than 75% of, the, of the, the economy of the country is based on foreign aid, which has now been suddenly cut. They're going to desperately need the aid money and the aid, the humanitarian aid itself, food aid, medical aid to come in this week, next week. There's no time to lose here. And that means they're going to have to negotiate. And that means they're going to have to change certain practices that's going to make those negotiations harder. So it's less in my mind, about the personal views of, of the Afghan, uh, of the Taliban leadership and of the membership, whether they have changed their ideological positions or changed their theological positions or not, I think they're going to have to adjust their practice based on what is going to be required in this new world 
Uh, now it's not looking good. It's not looking like they're taking seriously the, the human rights issues based on who they're negotiating with to possibly join their government. People like Gulbadin Hekmati are one of the leading brutal warlords uh, who was welcomed and armed by the United States in the 1980s. This is a guy where in, in school in the 1970s, he was the one who first created that very nice notion of using acid as a weapon to throw into the faces of young women who had the temerity to think they deserved to go to school and to get an education. That's who they're negotiating with. So it doesn't look great. But again, this is less about what they are thinking and more about the changes in the world that they are going to have to deal with. They're facing a huge brain drain with this 125,000 or more Afghans who have left in the last two weeks. That included a lot of the most educated people in the, in the country. Not all of them, thankfully, but a lot of people who have important skills had every reason to be frightened and they left. So that's going to be a huge challenge. The fact that right now the United States is preventing the IMF from, from allowing Afghanistan to have access to the $450 million allocated to them for COVID vaccine and treatment. That's a huge challenge that we in the United States need to be challenging. So our focus goes back to our obligations to the people of Afghanistan. That means accountability. In the long run, it means going back to the International Criminal Court, going back to the war criminals in this country to hold them accountable, dealing with the issues of compensation and reparations that we owe to the people of Afghanistan. But in the immediate, it means we have to take very seriously our obligations to the people seeking asylum. We have to expand those categories, allow in no caps on those refugees, no fees for the humanitarian parolees who are being allowed in. This is a, this is a huge desperate moment uh, for people and, and we need to step up for all of that. Let me just finish by saying that some things have not changed. The notion that there is no military solution to terrorism, 20 years later, that's still true. The reality that the US military budget goes up no matter what happens in the wars, that is true too. I don't know how many of you heard the news that just today, the House, Foreign, uh, the House Armed Services Committee just voted for $25 billion to be added to the additional money that the Trump administration, uh, sorry, very sorry, that the Biden administration was requesting for the military budget for this year. It went above what the Senate had asked for, $25 billion more. That would be enough to pay for vaccines for virtually all of the low-income countries around the world, that $25 billion. What's gonna make us safer as a nation? Those are the questions we have to continue to ask. What's gonna make us safer as a nation? What's going to prevent us from killing people around the world? There is both an economic reason and a moral reason to cut the military budget. There are proposals in Congress to cut it 10% now and move up to cutting it by 50% within the next several years. That's not gonna pass anytime soon, but that's what we have to be fighting for. That's the prize we have to keep our eyes on, is making that impossible, making future wars impossible. It's not going to be easy. This was not a celebration, the end of this war, but ending this part of it is very important. The words of Malalai Joya come back to me on a daily basis. I, the, the, at the time, the youngest member of the Afghan parliament who said, we in civil society, we women in Afghanistan, we have three enemies, the Taliban, the warlords disguised as a government and the US occupation. And she said, if you in the US can get rid of one of them, we'll only have two. I think that's a very pragmatic approach to where we are today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phyllis. I uh, got such a way of breaking it down so that we can all understand all these conflicting reports that we get. So I so appreciate your work and I so appreciate your words tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna uh, next move on to, to Kathy Kelly, who is another one of my very favorite activists and most valued resources in the peace movement. And what Phyllis is for my mind and keeping me up with policy, Kathy is for my heart and the, the much needed reminders of why we do this work. She's a three-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee, a co-founder of Voices in the Wilderness, co-coordinator of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. She's visited conflict zones all over the world, 
and carries with her and to us here in the U.S. the stories of the victims of U.S. foreign policy. She's defied U.S. sanctions to get medicine to ch sick children in Iraq and Palestine. She lived in ba Baghdad through the U.S. bombing during our 2003 invasion. She's been imprisoned for planting corn on U.S. nuclear missile silos. She's braved the bombs of opera Operation Cast Lead in Gaza to stay in solidarity with the children of Palestine. And she attempted to break the blockade of Gaza, bringing food and medicine to Palestine on the audacity of hope and aid boat. She's been to Afghanistan 15 times during the U.S. war there. She serves as a constant North Star for those of us engaged in this work. And I, I, I really appreciate you being here, Kathy. And um, if you can take it away, we're ready to hear you. Well, thank you very much, Will. It's, of course, good to be here with all of the peace action groups who have helped to gather us together. And thank you so much to each one of those groups for being active, for being out there on the streets in the farmers markets, at the um, fields where the drone and the manned aircraft are being maintained and taking off, it's, it's, it's very impressive. And I hope uh, that this time tonight um, will, will help keep all of us in a sense toned up to do what Phyllis is calling us to do, to keep on going up against the warlords of which the United States is perhaps the most well-heeled and in many ways the most dangerous just because of the extent of our weapon. And thank you Phyllis very much for your presentation and getting us started. And Chris, I sure look forward to hearing from you as well. Um, Cole, thank you for those points that you made. And so to begin with that first one that we have to stop making war on Afghanistan. You know, the United States was involved in negotiating a troop withdrawal. Had there been negotiations for peace, the United States would have been concerned about creating livelihoods for people in Afghanistan, because if people don't have jobs, then, you know, they'll pick up a weapon and fight for this warlord or that warlord, and the war goes on and on. But we didn't see that kind of negotiation that would have allowed for a changed economy. And with regard to what specifically the United States should stop, no drone strikes, no bombings, no special forces, no aid to rebel groups. I'm in touch very much with a young man whom I last saw in September of 2019. And he has fled because he really was genuinely afraid. But you know, the last time I saw him in a very hushed voice, he asked me, Kathy, did you know about Kadi, Kazi, and Jahandad, and Sabur, and Bahadir? And these were four young men who in Jalalabad, just outside a big city outside of Kabul, had been sleeping when special operations commandos trained by the United States broke into their home, killed all four of them. They were gathered together to welcome their father back from the Hajj and neighbor after neighbor, storekeeper after storekeeper said, these young men were not part of the Hajj. And so people were living in fear of warlords, of special operations commandos, of drone strikes all throughout the last 20 years. And, you know, they still have reason to fear. President Biden has been so clear that he didn't like the idea of boots on the ground in Afghanistan or a surge in the boots, but he likes the idea of combining CIA and drone strikes and drone surveillance and special operations. That's not going to constitute an end to the war in Afghanistan. And I think we have to listen to Daniel Hale. Because Daniel Hale, as an Air Force analyst, disclosed actual documents, US government documents that showed how in one five month operation called Operation Haymaker waged against Afghanistan, the United States drone strikes 90% of the time killed someone who wasn't the intended target. And so the idea that these drone strikes, you know, the drone operators, they, they see blobs on the screen, they don't see people. And the idea that somehow we can wage a, a kind of a war that's going to be more secure because we don't have boots on the ground I think that's a, a foolish notion and Daniel Hale should be thanked, not imprisoned. It's also, I think, important as Phyllis said, to, to mourn 
the lives of the people in Kabul who were killed after the terrible catastrophe at the Hamid Karzai International Airport. Because those people, you know, you can't hold children accountable and say, well, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Six children in a family were killed. Now, this time, I think there will be an investigation. There are lots and lots of journalists. And let's face it, in the last two weeks, there has been more attention paid to Afghanistan in two weeks than were paid over the collective last 20 years. So there were plenty of strikes, drone strikes and manned aircraft strikes that hit civilians and were never investigated. And this helped, of course, to build up the revenge and the rage and the desire for retaliation. And I think it also had to do with why, you know, a lot of the people that were fighting for the Afghan government to keep a government in power didn't really feel uh, a great desire to risk their lives on behalf of the people who were manipulating that government, almost like they were puppets, because they too had seen these terrible results. Um, I want to go on to that next point, engage with the Taliban and establish normal relations with the new government, pay reparations for the Afghan people. I'm so glad to see that word reparations there. And I think reparations should be understood not only as spending money. And, you know, we just are giving $10 billion to the Air Force for its over-the-horizon capacity to bomb Afghanistan from with drones and manned aircraft from Kuwait, from Qatar, from the United Arab Emirates, and from the Roosevelt, a carrier in the middle of the ocean. You know, that $10 billion, and Phyllis has also sketched out ways that monies could be spent wisely, that could be used for reparations. But it's not only a matter of the financial reparation for the bereavement and the torture and the displacement and the suffering caused, but also reparations should be understood. I guess you could, you know, kind of use the word repair as dismantling the war systems that caused the suffering in the first place. We can't afford this war system any longer. It's grotesque. It diminishes everybody. And there's no way we can have a rational discussion about climate catastrophe or pandemics if we don't dismantle the military systems. So yes, we should pay reparations. And also, I think we have to acknowledge, you know, what have we done? Phyllis mentioned that President Biden did talk about how the amount of money per day was $300 million every day for 20 years. Another way to look at that, in 2014, during what you know, the militarists bragged about being the largest retrograde mission in military history because Obama's surge was coming down and they were sending the troops home. If you took the sums of money spent and parceled it out per soldier per year, it would come out to $2 million per U.S. soldier per year that year. That same year, there were many thousands of children suffering from the kind of severe acute malnourishment that leads to chronic brain damage. But iodized salt, believe it or not, getting iodized salt into the diets of those children can actually help the children resist brain damage. And that would cost five cents per child per year. So could we see lady justice in the scales? Where do we want to put our resources, five cents per child per year to rescue a child from brain damage because of chronic malnutrition, or $2 million per year for soldiers and amongst the combat veterans still on an average, 22 per day take their own lives when they come back. So we must acknowledge these kinds of realities that have so sapped our credibility as a country that cares about other people. There's a, a, a network of surgical centers called the Emergency Surgical Centers for Victims of War. And I love these people. And so do people all around Afghanistan. They will stitch up anybody who comes to them. If the logo is on that truck that, or ambulance, it, it just won't be hit. And they've run three major hospitals and 41 forward operating clinics. And, 
And that same year that I mentioned with the $2 million per year per soldier, one of the head nurses at that hospital, Emmanuel Danini, he said to me in Kabul, you know, what, what if you just said bye-bye to three of your soldiers and you send them home early and uh, you give me that $2 million per soldier, what, what will I do with $6 million? Oh, I build another hospital. And this is the kind of practice that could be in place so that the United States wouldn't be feared as such a menacing country. And I certainly saw this with the young people I visited. They were exemplars. They were so brave and passionate. They, they so truly desired to get rid of wars. They didn't want to see any more wars. And they practiced sharing resources. They organized the widows to make big heavy blankets and they gave those away to people in the refugee camps. They knew those places. They did surveillance with notebooks and pens, going up icy mountainsides to sit down and talk with the widows and ask them, how often in a week do you eat beans? How much does it cost for you to get water? Because the widows way up at the top of the mountain had to walk down these icy paths and carry heavy buckets of water back up so the rents were lower. And then what was the age of the main income earner for the family? And if that income earner was under 12 years of age, that survey went to the top of the list. And then they figured out who they would try to help. So it, it, we shouldn't get the impression that the Afghans need us to come in there and save them. Oh, no, 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 no. They have many, many people who are upright, robust, strong people of great moral character. But they've been betrayed. As Phyllis said, they've been betrayed and abandoned by policies throughout these 20 years. They need livelihoods and they need ways to feed their families that don't make them dependent on warlords, particularly not the United States. Um, I say that there should be reparations paid, but I don't think those reparations should be entrusted to the United States to administer or even to collect, have an escrow fund, make it under the auspices of the United Nations. But I think there are reputable groups who could help with advising and distributing. I think about the Doctors Without Borders, the International Commission of the Red Cross, the Emergency Surgical Centers for Victims of War, the United Nations agencies. There are 38 of them who've been working in Afghanistan throughout all this time. Uh, environmental protection agencies, mine clearance agencies. Um, and, and I think of my young friends, and right now we are so worried for them, we don't even call them by their names or their organizational name, but let me just say young friends in Afghanistan. Cole had a point about cleaning house in Washington, DC, and that is so important. There ought to be a way to call the warlords to accountability. I wanna to mention two particular events, which I think historically ought to be almost like marker events. In uh, 2017, in April of 2017, the United States dropped a, it's called the GBU-43 um, massive ordnance air blast bomb. This is the largest bomb that the U.S. arsenal has short of a nuclear weapon. Huge, enormous bomb. They call it the mother of all bombs, which is a, a hideous name to assign to a bomb. But you know why they dropped it on a mountainside where there were, you know, the, it was populated largely by sheep and by goats. It was because inside the mountain was a very sophisticated network of tunnels used for communication and storage of weapons that the US built. And so that was their spot and they didn't want it to be taken over by groups they believed were hostile groups. And so they blasted the mountain to smithereens. But isn't that a telling statement that it was the US that built that facility in the first place as way back in the history, Zbigniew Brzezinski had said, this couldn't be better. Now the Soviet Union has their Vietnam and we can bleed them. And they saw it as a Cold War success. In October of 2015, the United States began to bomb a Doctors Without Borders hospital. 
immediately after the bombing started, the emergency room in the intensive care unit in the Kunduz province, the main hospital for a large stretch of that province, after that bombing started, Doctors Without Borders notified the United States government, NATO, the United Nations, you're bombing a hospital, you're attacking the emergency room, the ICU. And the United States C-13 huge transport plane outfitted with Bofor cannons and incendiary devices and Gatling gun type shooters flew away and then came back and bombed again and came back in 15 minute intervals for an hour and a half. And that green lighted the possibility that you could just bomb a hospital with impunity. The Saudis have done it, it's been done in Syria, but the United States has in Afghanistan set the standard, as Phyllis said, normalized torture, humanitarian uh, abuses, undermining of human rights, shrouding it in secrecy, and walking away promising investigations that never happened because the press and the Congress never really paid attention. So yes, clean house in Washington and use the Special Inspector General on Afghanistan reports that are filed quadrennially, have been filed every year by John Sopko and take those seriously. The Afghanistan papers did take them seriously, but the general said, oh, we're not gonna really have to worry about those Afghanistan papers. And I think to some extent they were right. Please try to look up the December 2018 USA Today story that describes with just unbearable detail how mercenaries, special operations mercenaries, got it so wrong in a particular village as they were trying to um, just get money and a contract for ex expanding an airport in a remote area of Afghanistan. And they hired gangs to do it. And then it ended up just becoming such a debacle that 91 people were killed by US forces with wrong information, 60 of whom were children. The wrongfulness certainly can be detailed for a long time, but I want you to know that a young friend of mine said to me in all earnestness, tell your parents in your country, don't send your sons and daughters to Afghanistan. It's dangerous for them here. And I think that you know, the people in Afghanistan are people who've meant us no harm. They, um, the ones that I knew would engage in projects like getting as many toy guns as they could and gathering child laborers and burying the guns and then planting trees on top of them. They would clean up contaminated, littered riverbeds. Uh, start a street kids school so that kids would be able to go to the government school even, even though they were child laborers. They tried again and again, but um, there, there, there was never any question of them being seen by people in the United States. And so I think part of our work is to listen, listen carefully for the cries and for the pleas and also for the wisdom of the people who have been so abused and so abandoned in the hubris of our war making. And we must, as Phyllis said, stop the United States from becoming the world's most menacing warlord and abolish all weapons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, I deeply appreciate your words. Um, now I, my my introduction for Chris may be uh, be lackluster because today is my my first time meeting Chris, um, but I what I do know is that my friends uh, Adrian Kinney and Garrett Reppenhagen, who I worked with first at Iraq Vets Against the War and later at Veterans for Peace, where I was a board member a few years ago, suggested that of all of the Afghanistan veterans that there are out there, that. Chris is the one we should we should talk to and have and make sure his uh, their voice are heard um, by this audience. So uh, I'm I'm really grateful for Chris's presence today. Uh, they're the digital organizer for Veterans for Peace and the lead lead organizer for Gamers for Peace initiative. Chris was a civil affairs operator in the United States Marine Corps from 2004 to 2010 
with combat deployments to Fallujah, Iraq, and Helmand Province. I wonder, we may have been in Fallujah at the same time, Chris, actually. Um, I, was, I was attached for the fall offensive, so conversation for a later date. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but also assigned uh, to, to Helmand province in Afghanistan. Chris is a lifelong gamer who's committed to using digital gaming and hobby spaces to engage anti-war and social justice ad- activism while combating the predatory recruiting practices of the military. Um, with the endorsements of, of Adrian and Garrett at Bets for Peace, I imagine your perspective is going to be no less poignant uh, than those of Phyllis and Kathy. So welcome and thank you for being here, Chris. Thanks for having me all. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I actually don't know how I'm supposed to follow up uh, Kathy and Phyllis. Um, that They take most of the words out of my mouth and with much more eloquence than I could ever muster. Uh, and I want to thank them for their uh, guidance and wisdom on this subject. And thank everybody for attending. Um, as well said, I was the United States Marine Corps uh, reservist from 2004 to 2010 and combat deployments to Fallujah, Iraq and Afghanistan as civil affairs operator, which uh, many of you might not be familiar with what that job is. Um, and I used to run around uh, over the last decade since getting out of the Marine Corps, we used to run around saying it's humanitarian aid on steroids. Uh, and that's quickly been revised over the course of the last couple of years to uh, I did humanitarian aid at gunpoint. Um, where I was holding the gun. And the, the story and the, the job of a civil affairs operator is to be a money-powered grunt, run around with a lot of money in a backpack, and an infantry unit sometimes would kick down a door, and I would follow up and take the homeowner aside and ask them, how are you doing today? I apologize for your door. Here's $600 for it. My friends are going to search your home for drugs, weapons, and other people that we're looking for. Would you care to tell me before they have to do that, if there's those things here? Also, while we're having this conversation, where do you get your water from? Where do your kids go to school? Where do you get your medical aid from? And what I've, I've realized is as I was plugging these people for information and getting them into our BAT system, biometric uh, scanning system, so that we could identify and catalog entire country of civilians, is... Oh, oh, what I was doing is getting information for intelligence and and perpetuating the war machine. In my naivety, as as deploying to Afghanistan, I was I was 24 years old. I was a 24 year old sergeant, and uh, I really thought I was there helping people. Uh, I believed wholeheartedly in my mission as a civil affairs operator that I was bringing peace or I was offering stability and opportunities to people. Um, I was a militarized Peace Corps, which is oxymoronic now that you look back on it. And uh, I I realize the error in my thinking along the way. But civil affairs comes out of a Vietnam tradition, the cat platoons in Vietnam, where you hear the saying, or the saying was born, uh, winning hearts and minds. And that was my job in the Marine Corps. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just a little bit about what I did. And I think, I think the easiest way to get into the rest of this conversation is uh, right now, uh, everyone, including myself, is wondering what's on the horizon, what's happening in Afghanistan, uh, and what's going to be happening in the near future. And I think, I think the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is how we got, got here, right? Um, what, the, what the intention of the war was, and I use uh, war as a term very loosely, uh, because what we didn't do is execute a war against a, a foreign government and another military force. We, we, we occupied civilian neighborhoods and communities in order to do who knows what. As a sergeant, I didn't know. Uh, And so why is it like this? It's like this because we have kids coming out of the economic draft that are 16 years old and talking to our recruiters before they ever talk to a a college recruiter or are given any other opportunity to escape poverty or the systems of oppression that they're in here stateside. And we put them in the military and then tell them to go overseas, armed, trained exclusively in, in war fighting, 
and then ask them to build society. Uh, I know as a 19 year old, I was wholly unqualified to determine what should be done to help fish farms in Iraq uh, or how what a hospital needs in Afghanistan, how to conduct contracts and do do civil engineering, society building, nation building. And I think we need to remember that humanita humanitarian aid at gunpoint just doesn't work. The, the efforts of the one export that the United States has is violence through its military. And right now, as we see in Afghanistan with the, with the withdrawal of troops, we still see our export going into that country uh, with drone strikes. We've heard Biden in his withdrawal statement say we are withdrawing so that we can turn around and focus on other areas, other hot spots of terrorism, including Syria. I believe he said, mentioned Somalia and other nation, other sovereign nations in Africa and in the Middle East. But then in the same sentence, turn around and say, and yet be back in Afghanistan again and reference Afghanistan in the same sentence as for what we're withdrawing from. Days later, we have a drone strike that kills 10 innocent civilians um, in response to a suicide bomber attack at a gate during evacuation. And latest reports that I've been seeing and articles that I've been reading is that in the aftermath of that explosion, I believe it was roughly 170 civilians were killed, Afghan civilians were killed, um, roughly. And eyewitness reports and, and things that are coming out is saying that the Marines were the ones that were killing the civilians after the initial explosion. And that's, that's because humanitarian aid done through the military doesn't work. And we've seen that over the course of 20 years. We've been doing counterinsurgency operations, coin operations, and civil affairs since we first went into Iraq um, and Afghanistan. So a 19-year-old is not qualified to nation build. And that's who we have doing this. We're in nebulous orders where we just hold and occupy territory. I can't tell you how many hospitals that I built in Afghanistan or how many schools that I built would get ransacked and then get rebuilt. And yet not understanding that I was a money man and, and my funds were just the funds that American people, the U.S., needed for its own infrastructure. We are sending people to countries and telling them to nation build in a nation that can't build itself currently. We have kids that are coming from crumbling homes and schools that are underfunded, building schools overseas in the name of the military. And it, it, it just continually, it, I can't, can't stress enough how much that just doesn't work. Uh, especially when you're ill-prepared to deal with cultural uh, ramifications and implications, nation and political ramifications, when politics and culture are not taught in academic circles for our children, uh, and they're not taught in the military either. So I, I, think, I think that the seven points that Will has outlined is a great starting point. And we have to remember that repealing the AUMF is a priority. Cutting the budget of the Pentagon is a priority. Uh, I was... Looking at some numbers, there's a, uh, an, uh, a YouTuber that we've hosted on Gamers for Peace um, who did a great video about the $2.7 trillion cost of what Afghanistan cost us, uh, cost in total. And um, uh, they gave great numbers, great examples of what we could have done with that money. $80 billion ends houselessness in the United States permanently. A one-time $80 billion expenditure ends houselessness for about $1 trillion, I believe it was. You get a light railroad, uh, a high-speed light railroad system that gets to every major city and acts as the center hub for travel and helps break the dependence on planes for high-speed travel. Um, you also have money for pandemic response, uh, Medicare for all, 
uh, and the list goes on of what you could do with the $2.7 trillion. Uh, and we're looking at a bloated defense budget of coming up on, I think if my math cor- is correct, we're at $790 billion with this recent $25 billion addition that there is being proposed in the past through the House. So nearly $800 billion is dedicated to Pentagon spending. And that's money that society needs, infrastructure, the social contract needs locally in, in, a, in and of ourselves. Um, I think how do we prevent this in the future is that we have to work in the intersections of social and climate justice with the military affects the majority of people, not just stateside, but around the world. The United States military is the world's number one carbon producer. And that's, that's not included in the numbers that we see about who has what nations have the largest carbon footprint. We don't even calculate, and it's not reported, how much carbon and cl- how much of a, a contributor to the climate crisis is the United States mil- military. And that's, that's just one aspect. You have drone war, the drone assassination program. When drones fly, civilians die. Uh, that's inherently true, as Daniel Hale uh, pointed out. 90, over 90% of drone flights result in civilian death. Uh, when in service, I was told many, many times, like, drones save my life. Drones are flying above you. They are saving your life. And, and I don't believe that was ever actually true. I don't think a drone ever once did something that inherently saved my life under fire. But I know that the, the information that I was gathering when I was doing humanitarian aid and putting myself out there in order to help the local civil, uh, civilians, the local population of Loy Calais and Alambar, or, um, of um, Southern INAC, I got my deployments mixed up for a second, Loy Calais in Southern INAC and INAC City Center, District Center, Nawa District Center is the areas that I was in in Afghanistan uh, in 2009. I these I was gathering information for civilians that would inevitably be killed. And there are children that delivered non and I worked with to help set up convenience stores that to now when I do the math in my head, they are military aged men at this point, which either puts them in this crosshairs of the Marines that replaced me a decade later or in the crosshairs of the Taliban. I do not know if the civilians that I touch the lives of are alive. More than likely, they probably aren't because of the size of the fobs that we are operating and starting to establish, which was part of my job. Uh, we destroyed farmland. I saw a question in there earlier about the, the heroin and poppy production of Afghanistan, and, and that works. And, and I think we look at everything that's going on right now with we have to continue to look at the complexity and, and nuance of the situation. We are withdrawing so that we can continue to do over the horizon missions in these areas. We have uh, military contractors. We have uh, non, why am I blank? We have mercenary organizations that are vying for contracts to go in, led by Eric Prince and the, the Ilks of Black, uh, Blackwater. We have, we have ramping up, we have an administration that is getting hit on both sides of, on one side, identity politics, talking about how we need to be in there for the sake of women and children and, and the and fear, mong- fear mongering, the uh, Taliban uh, impact on those populations. So we have the drumbeat from the a left position to urging us to stay there. And we have the right getting to point at a suicide bombing and, and continue to beat the war drums there. And we have an administration that has already con- said that it wants to continue doing over the rise in attacks. We also have a ramp up against China and, and their Belt and Road Initiative. And as the Belt and Road Initiative pulls, looks at going into the Middle East, Afghanistan and things, where does that put us in relation to that? 
The only export, as I said at the start, the only export we currently have is violence, whether that's humanitarian aid at gunpoint or or lifting up and exporting uh, a military to a militarized government, a, a government of warlords in this area. That is all that we are offering to these places because we cannot take care of ourselves here at home. How can we export humanitarian aid when there are we are facing our largest houseless com, uh, crisis ever? When we have uh, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations due to pandemic response, a failed pandemic response that saw people going back to work because we couldn't do the right thing and, and put a UBI or get benefits to people as they need them. Uh, I think I think we have to address the economic draft. If we want any chance of actually preventing further devastation against these populations, um, kids talking to recruiters, the military, uh, shameless plug for just a brief moment, but the military is operating in gaming spaces and in online spaces directly to recruit kids as young as 13, and put them in the military pipeline through games. If you look at numbers from 2020, about 13,000 new recruits at the age of 18 said that they were directly contacted and influenced to join the military through Twitch and gaming spaces. It's 13,000 children that had that a recruiter contacted them through through the hobbies and safe spaces that they try to get away from the failing infrastructure that they face every single day. The reason these kids are in video games is because parents are working two jobs and can't and, and can't create a, a, a family life or cr do anything. A lot of children, how many grandparents see kids with, with iPads in their hands playing Candy Crush or things like that? And those are the spaces, that's the pipeline that the military now occupies and is why we have continue to have this expanded budget for, expanded and bloated budget for a military that has no purpose. We, we outspend and have a larger military than the next, I think it's 20 nations, half of which are our allies. And we have no conventional warfare on the horizon. We have drone warfare on the horizon. We have AI drone warfare. The military looks at these places like games and online digital spaces and, is, and doesn't need troops on ground. It needs troops that understand how to occupy a virtual, understand a virtual space and how to have map awareness or, or projected awareness of what's around somebody in a, through a TV screen or a, mon a computer monitor. I think, I think that Starting with repealing and abolishing any AUMF uh, is is just the beginning. Drastically cutting the Pentagon's budget is needs to be at the forefront and combating the climate change. California is on fire. Lake Tahoe is on fire. Siberia just is on fire. The place Russia used to send exiles to die in the cold away from civilization because it was so cold is on fire and just put out enough carbon for Germany's emissions, I believe, for at least one year, if not two. And these are the ramifications of our bloated military budget. This is the ramifications of 20 years of attempted nation building from failed lessons out of Vietnam that translated to failed lessons in Afghanistan. And we need to be combating the military industrial complex, the war machine in every facet at the intersections of social justice and climate justice. Uh, I, think, I think there's so much to say. I think starting with the Pentagon Papers and getting the 300 names of the people that were on record Getting those names is a place to continue. Getting them tried for their war crimes. George Bush is a war criminal. It can easily be said that you can continue down the line of presidential administrations and call them all war criminals for keeping us in a failed war. A failed occupation, a failed col colony building, a failed attempt at imperialism. And the thing is, is that failed attempt is going to continue. It's, it's it, at right now when I prognosticate and I look at the future, I see manufactured consent in our media 
and the ability for uh, an argument to be made to mainstream Americans that we should still be in there. I see a resurgence and and in the mass memory of the people that we were even at war and at Afghanistan, in Afghanistan. And from both sides of the argument, uh, both sides of the political spectrum, there's, there's a desire to be there. And it scares me. It scares me because on January 6th, we saw veterans, we saw active service members, and we saw police storm the Capitol. And there's mass unrest in the failed infrastructure of our own nation. And what we're seeing overseas is just that export. So if you want to say that, if so, like maybe I should recant just a little bit of what I'm saying. Right. Maybe we did succeed in our imperialism because we sure as hell made a great copy of America and political unrest there. We put the lives of civilians in jeopardy around the world, wherever our bases are at. We have over 700 military bases around the world. We are occupying sovereign nations. And 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 maybe we have succeeded and maybe maybe we should work a little bit harder to make sure we don't succeed. In that again, uh, I think the seven points that are outlined are is is the starting point of where we need to be, and I think I think that that a resurgence in the anti-war movement uh, amongst the youth it can be found at the intersections of the issues that the youth is facing that of the people that have avoided the economic draft, the people that are still in economic straits because of school debts, lack of health care, ab- abortion rights are health care, as we s- see Texas eliminating abortion rights. These are major, major things that we face and that we are exporting these, cr- these crises around the world. And so um, thank you, everybody, for being here today to discuss about these, discuss these things. Um, you know, this is the rantings of just a, a Marine that, uh, that, that, did some time boots on ground and ran around with money signing blank checks that could have easily went to cities in Brooklyn or Philadelphia where I'm located or any place else in this country to really help people and impact lives in a better way. And the military is not the way to export that humanitarian aid that's much needed. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris. I am unsurprised to see that, that Garrett and Adrian did not lead us astray. Uh, in finding the right Afghan uh, Afghanistan vet to uh, to talk to us tonight, um, we're going to move into Q and A at this point. Um, and I, I want to uh, point out that there are a lot of great links and a lot of great information, a lot of meaningful comments in the chat. So I encourage you all to to look through that chat as you go. Um, and I'm going to open with a, qu- a question uh, from Janet Slagter. It's uh, on sanctions on, on individual members of the Taliban. So Janet asks, some organizations while calling, for example, for countries to open their borders for refugees and asylum seekers and for negotiations with Taliban are nonetheless calling on the US, UNSC to reinstate the sanctions imposed on Taliban leaders in 2011. Those UNSC sanctions prohibited their travel froze their assets held in financial institutions, limited their access to buying weapons and their access to international banks and international loan funds, IMF and WB. These Taliban leaders have pushed these sanctions to be lifted. Phyllis stated that sanctions will not be felt by leaders, but everyday people. Is that true for these individual sanctions and should they be abandoned? Should I jump on first and then others can- I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, the answer is yes, it will still be felt by the populations. For example, the question of prohibiting travel from Taliban leaders. These may be the people who are going to have to negotiate how to create a humanitarian corridor to allow humanitarian aid shipments to get in. If they can't travel to, whether it's to Quetta or to Tajikistan or to Qatar, Who's going to do that negotiation? They don't have such a high level of, of trust within their organization that they can just send somebody else. You know, this, this is a very hierarchical, top-down organization. If you prohibit the leaders from going somewhere to talk, you're not going to talk to them. So that's one impact. 
the, the notion, I mean, it all sounds very good. This is a lot about posturing. Well, we're gonna freeze their assets. I can pretty much guarantee that the top Taliban leaders do not have assets in the United States. I, I say that without any personal knowledge of where they have their assets, but these are not people who grew up in educated situations where they have connections internationally and have traveled and have opened bank accounts in other countries and that sort of thing. So that's just not gonna mean anything. What we need is a way of engaging on questions of humanitarian access, which, which means talking to whoever is there. We don't have to call it direct military, uh, direct diplomatic relations. I think that's probably not realistic at this stage. The reality is the US has been negotiating with the Taliban for the last two years that we know of probably before that as well. And they will continue to do that. That's how they managed to get a, a transfer of power from the, around the airport. That didn't work very well, but it worked a lot better than it would have if there had not been any direct consultation between the US and the Taliban about how that was going to, to work. So yes, I think we have to say no economic sanctions. People can have all kinds of arguments about, well, could we do this to that individual? And frankly, the time that gets wasted in those kinds of discussions could far better be spent figuring out where are we gonna get the money to pay for food for a population where 80% of the population today, today is food insecure. That should be the basis of the, of the discussion. There's plenty of punishments that are deserved and should at some point be imposed, starting in Washington and in Crawford, Texas. There's plenty of punishments that are deserved, but that's not what's going to feed people today in Afghanistan. So I think that we need to keep our eye on what is urgent for today. What do we do about the fact that 2,200 hospitals are closing in the next two days? People don't stop getting cancer. Women don't stop giving birth. People don't stop getting diabetes and every other disease known to people because there's a war on. And because the war stops, they don't stop getting all those diseases either. So when hospitals and clinics close, people die. So that I think needs to be our first set of demands never underestimating the, the, the crimes that have been committed by the Taliban. There's no question about that. Massive human rights violations, no question about that. There is a question about what violations are continuing to be carried out now, that we don't know. We do know there's plenty that there should be some accountability for in the past. But right now, our government has an obligation. Remember, we're talking here about what are our demands of our government. That may be different than what we as peace activists want to do or say or whatever, but what we call on our government to do is to start the process of taking responsibility for the havoc, for the chaos, for the devastation they have brought. There's a, a statement from, it's from the, from the ancient Romans, from Tacitus that I used to quote all the time. Kathy probably heard me say this 35 times when we were on the road together during the early days of the, of the Iraq war, which is the Romans brought devastation and they called it peace. This is very much what the US is doing. It, it stopped for the moment, which is good. We should celebrate that, that the US is no longer bombing and drone striking and attacking Afghanistan and Afghans. That's important and we should make sure it continues. But that's not peace when people are still living with the consequences of 20 years of that devastating war. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, Chris, Kathy, would either of you like to, to respond to the individual sanctions question? I would just like to reiterate that the United States was a warlord as cruel and brutal and uh, to be held accountable as much as any other warlord operating in Afghanistan. And you know, if you um, want to see a society better able to cope with a repressive government, strengthen civil services, strengthen education, and don't isolate the society, and sanctions have tended to move in that direction, you never, ever, ever punish children, hungry, thirsty children, because of the people governing them. 
Thanks. So thank you, Phyllis, for laying that out further with the many necessary details. But in no way should we be waging an economic warfare against people in Afghanistan and couching it in righteous terms of Baha, we're going to punish those uh, warlords. Uh, it certainly didn't work with Iraq. 500,000 families have lost loved ones that will never return, and they were children. I, I just wanna jump in and j pretty much mirror the same points as Phyllis and Cassie. Um, Sanctions affect the population more so than anybody at the government, especially when you have secret CIA director meetings with the head of the, with Taliban spokespeople or people in the government. Um, sanctions, sanctions at this point would be a continuation of war crimes against a, against that civilian population. Uh, in my, this is completely my opinion and. And maybe it's a little bit of optimism and naivety, but the idea of engaging in dialogue and 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 recognize potentially recognizing uh, a government that's in power and focusing on diplomatic aid to help establish a civilian like care for the population should be the forefront of the beginning of us. Uh, recompensing the population that we have wrought devastation on for 20 years. Um, it's the only way forward in peace, right? The moment you start sanctioning and punishing is the moment that you keep vengeance on the line. And Biden has already committed us to, to this vengeance mentality. Um, it's, it, and we saw it as a result of the, uh, the suicide bombing. And in this continual pursuit of of boogeymen, of, of terrorist boogeymen, individual actors that aren't states and aren't representative of a population that we continue to target the population for. And that is a war crime. And if we were, were to do sanctions, we'd just be continuing to harm. Um, it, I wouldn't even call us having ended the war in Afghanistan. I would just say that we're in the 21st year of it at that point. So. Thank you. I'm going to take a, a question from Leah Bolger. Hi, Leah. It's good, good that you're here. Um, this is specifically for Chris, although I imagine Kathy might have some insights as well. Leah asks, do you think there were, there were very many Afgan Afghans who helped the U.S. because they were co coerced or not really given much of a choice? Or do you think it was mostly voluntary, the, the Afghans who helped U.S. forces? I, I think when when you have an occupying force that is armed with weapons that you've never seen before or uh, like and and has capabilities that you only have one option i think that i think that going into the ancap like the afghanistan national police going to the afghanistan national military is is by conscription out of fear of life cuz once you're yeah, i'm going to speak about the male side of that equation you hit 12 or you're a tall nine-year-old you're a military aged man you're a target for me and my guys you are suspected of having weaponry on you you are analyzed as a threat that that child that i gave you the example of that brought me non to the fob that i helped set up still went through pat downs and he was a 10 year old still still was checked and we still every time he came to the gate even i had the bias that this child was eventually going to be or potentially be somebody that i'm pulling the trigger at one day or that somebody that replaces me will one day pull the trigger at so you either go into these things to avoid your own economic poverty to to because we've also destroyed your sustainable farming in the area in order to set up these fobs there are militarized patrols through what amounts to be your neighborhood in and city so you don't have much of another option you you, you either become an interpreter you become a cop you go into the military you do whatever it takes to to survive in the face of of economic economic devastation and and that's the same thing i want to i i keep talking bring it back to what we face stateside also that's not unlike what we see with our own children 
It's not what like it's not unlike what we see happening in our black and brown neighborhoods with policing of 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 our local neighborhoods. Uh, last year, personal anecdote: last year, I was at some of the George Floyd Floyd protests, and I'm sure a lot of people here were also. But I didn't expect to have an MRAP and a mine resistant vehicle, mine resistant tank, pretty much have an up gunner on it firing grenades at me which was something that we did in Afghanistan. Like, so the, the war that we're fought over there and the conditions by which people are obligated to work with Americans are the same exact conditions that our black and brown children are facing here and our population is facing here. And so the, you, can, you can walk into the Bronx and, and get a taste of some of the things that are and the get a understanding of the reasons why people make the decisions they do in order to survive underneath American colonialism. Thanks, Kathy or Phyllis. Do you have anything to to add to that? The the uh, economic reality of cooperating with the U.S. I would just you can look in the. Sorry, go, on. go ahead, Phyllis. No, you go. I was just say you can look in the census report that shows how many bullets were sold to Afghanistan in the year of 2018, and it was something like 23 million. And I thought, why are they doing this? Why sell so many bullets to Afghanistan, a country poised on the verge of civil war? And then I started looking back into old Newsweek reports, and apparently it was quite commonplace for soldiers in the Afghan local police or the Afghan National Defense Forces to take their rifles and shoot bullets into the air, just shoot them, not shoot Taliban, shoot the bullets in the air, and then go collect the casings on the bullets, and then take those casings to the local scrap metal dealer so they could put food on the table. Um, we're talking people who wanted food on the table and still do. That's so important. So I think that $23 million worth of bullets was to replace the ones from the previous year, um, whereas we should have just sent $23 million worth of food. That's such an important question. I was just going to add one point to Chris's very important point about why do we see, you know, armored personnel carriers on the streets of Ferguson when Mike Brown was killed? Why do we see MRAPs on the streets now during the Black Lives Matter protests? The answer is something called the Pentagon's 1033 program which is this explicit program that's designed to give excess military equipment, including weapons like tanks and, well, not tanks actually, but MRAPs, armored personnel carriers, night vision goggles, until recently it also included all kinds of weapons that was stopped by Obama. Trump lifted that restriction, Biden replaced the restriction, but there's a move to end the program most these days, most of those weapons are coming from Afghanistan. It's, you know, you all read about during the, the pullout, they were disabling and blowing up helicopters and weapon systems and all kinds of things so they wouldn't fall into the wrong hands, right? Well, a lot of them, they do prepare on this stuff. They don't prepare to get people out and safe, but they do prepare to get weapons out and safe. So a lot of those weapons are shipped back to the U.S., and then what's the Pentagon going to do with them? They're not the highest tech, newest, what we're going to send with the troops for the next invasion. They're sitting around. So the word goes out to every state or local police station, police force saying, do you want this? They pay nothing. They don't even have to pay transportation for it. They just have to pay upkeep. And they get trained in how to use it. You say, well, wait a minute. Why would the police department of Ferguson, Missouri, a little town, what would they need with an armored personnel carrier? Well, we've got drug dealers, we've got, you never know, right? And then when they have it, they use it. That's the lesson of weapons. If you have it, you're gonna use it. So that's why this has become a commonplace thing. And it's all made available because the Pentagon has su supposedly excess uh, uh, material because of all of these Pentagon contracts that all go back to the military producers. So it all comes back to the money, all comes back to the money. So there is a very important campaign underway to end the 1033 program. There's a number of members of Congress who have signed on to it. There is a, there's two bills that are currently pending. One is better than the other, and I'm not, I can't remember which is which, so I'm not going to try and tell you. 
but there are important uh, campaigns to end that uh, to end that program. Well, thank you all for your insight on that. Um, next question, it, it made some interesting, uh, th there's been an interesting follow-up uh, in the chat. It's from Yannick Joseph. Uh, as shocking as U.S. policies may seem to progressives, the U.S. is acting like other empires which have preceded it. The U.S. is an empire, not a regular country. We ca can we act through the United Nations rela and related organizations? It seems like in the long run, Pakistan, which, uh, which enabled and aided the Taliban, will be, a, be playing a greater role in Afghanistan. Faced with this enormous responsibility, they may welcome help from non-governmental sources in the U.S. Can we identify and work with Pakistani and Indian progressives who want to help the Afghan people? Kathy, this, one's a little, this is a little bit outside my wheelhouse, but I'll follow up to somebody if I think of something. <laughs> well, certainly there are... Pakistani and Indian progressives in the United States who want to help the Afghan people. I mean, I've been turning to Pakistani friends who might find quite progressive to ask them to help us with, um, you know, friends who are stranded in, in, in Pakistan right now. Uh, there, there are many groups in India that uh, practice permaculture and have in the past invited young Afghans to come and join them as interns. There are groups that in India have been um, trying to oppose India's weapon policies and, and the, the terrible governance of Narendra Modi in terms of the impact of um, human rights violations. And, and, and they've welcomed young Afghans uh, to be part of their work. I'm sure that uh, this is possible and I completely agree. The United States is an empire in decline. Empires in decline are particularly dangerous and uh, definitely the United Nations, absent the Security Council, would be the place to turn. But I don't think we should entrust the Security Council with major decisions because that's really taking a collection of warlords and gi giving them power that they haven't used very well in the past. I think that's absolutely right. I, I do think that the lack of other global agency we have global agencies on specific issues, uh, global non-governmental agencies dealing with health, dealing with food, dealing with water, but overall assistance is still very much a product of governments, largely because of the amounts of money involved. You know, we're not talking here about small organizations raising, you know, a, a few thousand or a few hundred thousand dollars that could be turned over to a counterpart organization in Pakistan to be delivered to Afghanistan or, or directly to Afghans. There isn't that kind of capacity in civil society in Afghanistan at this stage to absorb the kinds of money that is required to rebuild the country. There's going to have to be governmental engagement. And that means the United Nations, which for all of its um, problems, and some of you know I've spent years researching the whole question of US domination of the UN, which has changed in certain ways in recent years, but it's, it's a big problem, but it's the closest thing we have to a more accountable institution uh, on the levels of issues around uh, humanitarian aid, food and water, emergency aid, or you know, the agencies like OCHA, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Humanitarian Overview Organization, the WFP, the WHO, the UNDP, all of these organizations, they're not separate from the domination of the Security Council in terms of budgets and that sort of thing, but the General Assembly can be pushed to take more of an, an initiative. And in theory, they have control over money uh, in a way that the council does not. So it's partly about political will getting that fight, but the key thing is to get the US to be prepared to put hundreds of millions and then billions of dollars into the funding of the rebuilding of Afghanistan. And now millions into the emergency, uh, the emergency campaigns that are underway for this very urgent moment, which does need to go through the United Nations. And that's already underway. Those are the agencies that have stayed. They haven't left. Médecins Sans Frontières has stayed as well. Uh, emergency is staying. Uh, but all the UN agencies, there's 30 some odd of them, are, they're all mm -hmm. staying for now. And that's where the money can be directed and most of it will get to 
uh, people in need, probably not all of it, but most of it, which is a better level than we've got pretty much anywhere else. Thank you both. Um, and we are, we are getting low on time. Uh, I'm, I think this is probably going to have to be our last question. It's from Stephanie Hiller. Um, why don't we put women in charge of humanitarian effort there instead of, quote, engaging with the Taliban? Is there, is there a woman-led infrastructure in Afghanistan that we could point to or um, deliver money to? Hmm. You know, I would stay for the moment with, with Phyllis's recommendation to work through the 38 agencies of the United Nations, some of which do rely on and employ women and uh, hope that all of those agencies can insist that their women workers uh, can be with them. But um, the, the truth is, uh, there's been a tremendous discrimination against women throughout these 20 years. And I, I don't know that you'd find a women's organization that um, would be able to stand up to, to the male dominance. However, um, you have um, some very strong women's organizations whose, whose voices I think should be heard. I, I'm very grateful for um, the revolutionary Afghan Women's Association, Rawa and Malalaya Joya, um, certainly for women for Afghan women, uh, uh, th there are women's groups, but I, I wouldn't want to, at this urgent critical moment, uh, sidestep trying to get funds and resources through the United Nations. I also think it's very important that we not have this sense that we should choose who the money should go to. Any organization, however good it is, that is singled out by particularly the United States, but by any outside country, um, number one is going to be in, in, in terrible trouble for that. They will probably be forced to disband, their people will be at risk and they'll have to leave. So it probably wouldn't work. But it's also, in my view, we should not be the ones choosing who represents Afghan women or Afghan people that we should choose where to put the money. The reality of nation states is a big problem. Governments never represent their people very well. Some are better than others, but none are really very good. The Taliban is certainly not going to be very good. But we do live in a world where people live in nation states. And until that changes, and I think that's an urgent thing to be changing, getting rid of nation states, but we're not going to see that, well, certainly not in my lifetime, but probably not in most of our lifetimes. Um, in the meantime, we have to deal with governments that exist. They hold power. And that is what it takes to do the logistical work of getting food out to a population of 35, 37 million people. We just don't have an alternative capacity um, to do that. So I think both on the level of capacity to absorb and use those kinds of the amounts of money we're talking about and the, the appropriateness of us in the United States choosing who we think should be the recipients, I think that it, we have to go back to the UN. And if I could just add the idea that um, somehow efforts and investments should be put in the, into extraction of minerals ought to be uh, held up as something that actually is inimical to the cares and concerns of women and children of Afghanistan, because the water table is already so low, partly because of the drought, that if mineral extraction projects are started up, that will bring the water table even lower and it will make it harder to grow crops and perhaps easier than to grow opium. Mineral extraction is a major thing for a major contributor to climate change. And it, it's a major contributor to the reasons the military gets involved in very, for emperor, uh, that the empires utilize their military. So uh, cautioning against just trying to use military or use mineral extraction or the, as a vehicle by which to solve the problem problems that the people of afghanistan are facing is something to very much be aware of caution against and and work to find a solution that doesn't include that that doesn't give reason for somebody to want put a military in there that doesn't put private companies in control of large swaths of land um because whether whether it's american whether it's an American colony or a multinational corporation's colony that's extracting 
land and wealth, we're still seeing the oppression of the people occur there for, for those minerals or, or oil or whatever other market that capitalism is trying to break into. So I think I would definitely caution against saviorism through minerals or anything along those lines. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. So um, in closing, I just want to say tonight's program was offered free of charge. But each of the chapters of Peace Action who helped make tonight possible depend on our members as our primary source of funding and also our primary source of labor to do the organizing and hard work of challenging the military industrial complex. So if you are so moved, I would encourage you to go to your local ch chapter's website, make a financial gift or get in touch and make a gift of your time volunteering. Um, and deepest thanks to Chris and Phyllis and Kathy for your words, your hearts, your minds. Um, thanks to Mass Peace Action for pulling us all together. Um, and everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.